Welcome guys, Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring, and we're going to cover the highest yield PED plateau annihilating questions for the USMLE Step 2 CK, as well as the shelf exam. This is going to be extremely fast paced, and there is an abundance of high yield information that you, chances are might not see a question on in UWorld for some of it, but it will show up on MVMEs as well as your actual USMLE. So it'll be an assortment of stuff that shows up on every exam, as well as the stuff that I've seen show up that students are not prepared for. If you want to keep in contact, my Twitter is action underscore AP. If you'd like one-on-one -on -one coaching, my website is actionpotentialmentoring.com. Feel free to book a free call with us to learn a little bit more about what we do. All right, so let's dive right in here. In my opinion, PEDS is legitimately one of the toughest shelf exams. It covers essentially everything, it seems like, by the time that you get through with it. So I'm going to try and give you kind of some of the most common causes as well as some of the super rare disorders that they love testing on. So first off, let's start off with the most common cause of rheumatic disease in a child, which is JIA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. This is tested on a huge amount of students' exams. So it's going to be a patient that's less than 16 years old, and generally they'll have the triad of arthralgia, uveitis, and a rash. And so uveitis is oftentimes the first symptom that these patients will actually get. So don't be thrown off by that uveitis. And there's a couple of different subtypes of JIA. The ANA is positive. It's generally oligoarticular, and sometimes they call that posse articular on the exam. If the ANA is negative, however, it's generally polyarticular. And you need to be familiar as well with Stills disease. And so the Stills disease is arthralgias, a salmon colored rash, a quotidian fever, and serositis. And so I remember back as a med student, I literally did not even know what quotidian fever was, and I just had it memorized as part of Stills disease. And so it's just a fever that occurs every 24, day, 24 hours. So you want to make sure that you actually know the real definition of it because they're not going to give you the buzz phrase quotidian on the test. And then serositis, of course, is inflammation of your serosal structures. And so you can get pleural effusions and pericardial effusions from all the inflammation. The treatment is going to be an NSAID for juvenile idiopathic arthritis. If the NSAID fails to help resolve symptoms. You can upgrade them to a DMARD such as methotrexate. All right, let's do a clinical scenario. You have a five-year-old patient with a sore throat. Two or three days later, they have a fever with joint pain, swelling that's worse in the morning, and an elevated ESR. We are thinking JIA. So the big trick on this is they will give you rheumatic fever as an answer choice to try and steer you away from JIA because they both are going to be kind of like a flu-like illness that then has joint pain. But remember, rheumatic fever is four to six weeks later. JIA is much closer in proximity to their illness. And so rheumatic fever also has some other symptoms. If you guys know the Jones criteria, J for joint involvement, O because an O kind of looks like heart, N for nodules, E for erythema marginatum, and then S for Sydenham chorea, which are the dance-like movements of the patient. And so this rash right here, you have to be able to identify is associated with the Jones criteria for your rheumatic fever. This is your erythema marginatum. As you see here, there's sharply demarcated margins and it's serpiginous like a snake. And so Stills disease has the salmon rash, S for S, still salmon. And then for rheumatoid fever, you have to know this erythema marginatum. All right. Next, we have a child with acute lymphocytic leukemia with new vesicles. Well, you want to have VZV on the top of your differential. And so the NBME, I've seen them listed as HHV3, human herpes virus 3. So make sure that you're on the lookout for that as an answer choice as well. And keep in mind that you're going to need to counsel the patient for when they get older, they could get post-herpetic neuralgia. This is something that the family medicine shelf likes to test on because it ties in the peds with the geriatrics. And so post-herpetic neuralgia is the dermatome distribution of neuropathic pain. Next, the treatment of VZV is going to be acyclovir, just like with pretty much any of the other herpes viruses. That's generally your safest bet for a treatment choice. And keep in mind that the NBME can put guanosine analog as an answer choice, and that's just another way of discussing the mechanism of action of acyclovir. And they love throwing in some of those step one concepts into the step two exam to help separate and stratify students' scores. And so make sure you know that acyclovir is a guanosine analog. Don't get confused with herpangina. Herpangina is from Coxsackie virus, and it's basically vesicles on the soft palate, the pharynx, and they're going to be oval and gray. And they'll also have vesicles on the hands and feet of the patient. So that's hand, foot, and mouth disease. 
make sure that you know if her pangina is different. So keep that in the back of your mind. All right, next. Something that's good to know is that gynecomastia can be normal in boys that are 12 to 14 years old. So you don't always have to work them up for additional disease. But if you do see testicular atrophy, tall stature, and long extremities, you should start thinking Kleinfelter. Keep that on your differential if you see the testicular atrophy. All right, this image right here is absurdly high yield. It shows up on literally every year NBMEs. And so this is a congenital melanocytic nevus. So generally it's going to self-resolve or it will not change in size too much with the patient after a few years of age. But if it's greater than 20 centimeters, you have to be concerned for cancer. And so 20 centimeters sounds absolutely huge and it really is. So keep that in mind that if it's a smaller congenital melanocytic nevus, you don't need to do anything. But if it's huge, then you may want to work the patient up for cancer. All right. Nevi flamius. This is oftentimes self-resolving. You might have seen kind of like a peach colored rash on the back of a patient's neck or on their face. If it's on the face, it usually resolves. If it's on the neck, sometimes it gets lighter over time, but it doesn't resolve. And so don't be worried because test questions can list these nevi flamius as capillary malformations. So don't let that scare you and make you think that it's a big blood vessel issue that you would need to do surgery on or anything like that. It generally is self-resolving. You don't need to do anything for it. If it's a big dermatomal distribution on the face, you should be on the lookout for Sturge Weber syndrome. Okay, and so I've seen the NBME listed as encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis. And you need to know that name because it's literally on your NBMEs, meaning that it's fair game for the USMLE. And so just break down the word. Encephalo means head, trigeminal means five, and then angio means blood. So on your head, trigeminal distribution, either V1, V2, V3, and angio meaning blood. And so here's kind of what it looks like. With these port wine stains, if there is a trigeminal distribution, you should get an MRI of the brain. This is your next best step type question. And you want to look for capillary venous malformations up in the brain. And the buzzwords that they can give you is a leptomeningeal angioma, as well as episcleral hemangiomas. So those are big, big buzz phrases that you need to know for Sturge Weber. Leptomeningeal angioma and episcleral hemangioma. And so... If the patient is really stressed by the port wine stains and it's causing a bunch of psychologic distress, you can actually do laser therapy to treat it, but it's not mandated. Okay, so high yield TQ for your family medicine shelf as well as step two. What should you counsel the patient and family on if they have Sturge Weber? Well, you want to discuss the risk for glaucoma and seizures down the line. All right, something I've personally had a TQ on, and this is a very rare syndrome that I want to make sure you guys are all familiar with. Clapel trinani weber syndrome. And so this is a port wine stain plus varicose veins in different limb sizes. So you can remember that there's port wine because the word Weber is in the name, right? So Sturge Weber has port wine. So does Clapel trinani weber syndrome. And they have varicose veins in different limb sizes. If you see a patient with different limb sizes, two of the things on your differential should be Clipo trinani weber syndrome as well as your beckwith wiedemann syndrome. Because remember, they have hemihyperplasia of the body. Number six, atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema. Treatment of choice on the NBME is going to be triamcinolone for flares, but you don't want to use this for more than a couple weeks because it can cause atrophy of the skin. So keep that in the back of your mind. Here's a test-taking tip. This will help you. I've seen lindane as an answer choice on NBMEs. If you see it, just cross it off immediately. So NBME says that it's not used anymore because it's neurotoxic. It used to be used for lice. First Aid did advocate for it in some of the prior editions. So if you have an older edition of First Aid, make sure that you know that it's not used anymore. The actual treatment of lice is topical permethrin or ivermectin. Okay, so you always start with topical, least invasive to most invasive. If topical fails for lice, you can then put the patient on PO ivermectin. And just to keep in mind, that you do not need to keep your kids from school. That's a commonly tested fact as well. You can send them still to school, just put them on the topical permethrin or ivermectin and you're good to go. Number eight, a patient gets anaphylaxis after a blood transfusion. They have a history of sinopulmonary infections. What's your diagnosis? What's well, gonna be IgA deficiency? Brown urine plus a cold plus normal C3 complement. And so that's IgA nephropathy, AKA Berger disease. And so make sure that you know this. Brown urine plus a cold plus normal C3 complement, it's going to be IgA nephropathy. And so 
the big differentiating fact here is that post-strep glomerulonephritis has a decreased C3 complement level. This is how you tell them apart if the question stem does not give you the anti-DNAs or the anti-streptolysin O titers. So if it's normal C3 complement, thinking IgA nephropathy. If it's decreased complement, you're thinking post-strep glomerulonephritis. Number nine. If you see a patient with recurrent catalase positive organism infections, usually going to be staph in most question stems, plus normal concentrations of their white blood cells and immunoglobulins, I want you thinking chronic granulomatous disease. Okay. And so here's all the catalase positive bugs that I've seen tested. So staph is most common. About eight out of 10 questions, they're going to have staph. They can also include nocardia, pseudomonas, listeria, aspergillus, which actually comes up from time to time, candida. E. coli, B. cepatia, serratia, H. pylori, and aspergillus again. So I don't know why I listed that twice there. But you need to know that catalase positive is CGD, chronic granulomatous disease. Most commonly, it's going to be staph. Second most commonly I've seen tested is aspergillus. Maybe that's why I listed it twice there. And then also, nocardia does show up from time to time. But usually, if they give you one of the more rare bugs like nocardia or B. cepatia, they're going to give you also either aspergillus or staph in the question. So they're not going to just give you, oh, the patient had a B. cepatia infection. What is it, right? That's way too difficult. So keep that in the back of your mind. Here's an extremely rare test question that I have seen show up on step one and step two. And so this is Job syndrome, also known as hyperimmunoglobulinemia E syndrome. So the mnemonic here is faded. This will get you literally everything you need to know on Job syndrome. F for a coarse phage. A for cold staph abscesses. T for retained primary teeth. So they'll have essentially two rows of teeth. And that's kind of like what gives it away for me generally in the question stems. E for high IgE, which has abnormal TH17 lymphocytes. And it's basically an impaired neutrophil chemotaxis. And then D, dermatologic issues such as eczema. So the treatment for Job syndrome is going to be antibiotics for all these infections. Keep in mind, these are cold staph infections. And so the reason that you need to know it's cold is because there's not going to be a bunch of inflammation. There's not going to be like a ton of neutrophils there because this is a neutrophil chemotaxis issue. Okay. And so these patients generally will die by the age of 30, but you want to treat the infections with antibiotics as long as you can. Number 11, erythema infectiosum. And so the key word here is infectiosum, which I bolded and made red because I want you to remember that the infectiosum should remind you of an infection, aka parvovirus B19. And so the symptom as adults is going to be polyarthropathy. And the symptom as children is going to be the classic slap cheek rash. So keep in mind that the slap cheeks then will spread to the body and limbs. And these patients also have a risk of an aplastic crisis, especially if they have other red blood cell disorders. So that's what the slap cheek looks like. I mainly included this because I wanted you to know the name erythema infectiosum because they're rarely going to give you the parvovirus B19 as an antitrust. They're going to make it tough on you and give you the erythema infectiosum. All right, number 12, thalassemia. You got to be able to diagnose this on peripheral smear. And so the T for thalassemia stands for T for target cells. So they're going to have a low RDW and they're going to be microcytic. So an MCV less than 80. And this is what your target cell looks like. You can see that there's a target in the middle, some clear area around that, and then the rim again of the red blood cell. So let's go through all the microcytic anemias real quick. The mnemonic here is TAILS. This has saved me a million times. So T for thalassemia, A for anemia of chronic disease, this is almost never the correct answer in a PEDS patient. I for iron deficiency, so look for bleeding. L for lead poisoning. And S for sideroblastic anemia. And so I'm going to include the peripheral smear for lead poisoning because it's so high yield. And you see the basophilic stippling in it right here. All those little dots. And so a good mnemonic for lead poisoning, just because it shows up so often on your boards, is ABCDEFG. And so... This is in a patient that is essentially living in an old house from like the 1960s and the kid licks some of the chip paint or maybe they have an old toy from their grandparents and the toy was made out of lead still. So these are all things to look for. A for anemia, of course. B for basophilic stippling. C for colicky pain. D for diarrhea. E for encephalopathy. That's really important to look for is the neuro defects. F for foot drop. And then G for gums with lead lines. So that's your mnemonic for lead poisoning. Number 13, HUS versus TTP, hemolytic uremic syndrome versus TTP. So most people forget 
that HUS does not have a fever classically. Okay. They may not give you the neuro symptoms and they may not mention if they're neuro intact in the questions then, which is what most people differentiate HUS and TTP with, but you still have to be able to make the difference without them mentioning the neuro deficits. Okay. So here's kind of a helpful image for that. So everything in green is HUS. So you have the hemolytic anemia, uremia, and thrombocytopenia, of course, that's what the name says. And then TTP has essentially everything plus a fever and neurologic symptoms. So make sure you know this little diagram, draw it out a few times if you have to. Number 14, seeing this tested, vitamin E deficiency can also present with a hemolytic anemia plus generalized muscle weakness. And so these patients can present very similar to vitamin B12 deficiency. And they have that posterior column and spinocerebellar tract demyelination. You need to know this. So tie vitamin E deficiency and vitamin B12 deficiency symptoms together in your mind. All right. Number 15, met hemoglobinemia. And if you look, I capitalized and bolded and read the METH in the beginning because the treatment is methylene blue for meth hemoglobinemia. And so this is generally a patient that recently got a bedside procedure with an anesthetic, maybe they had the, some lidocaine or benzocaine, or they had some nitrates that are found in meats or exposure to dapsone. Okay. And so remember that dapsone is one of the treatments that you can get for dermatitis herpetiformis with celiac disease. And then nitrates, you can usually see in a question stem, a patient had a piece of sausage or something like that. And so the diagnosis for methemoglobinemia, you want to look for a low partial pressure of oxygen and an oxygen saturation that maxes out around 80%, even with supplemental oxygen. And that's because of the irons carrying capacity that's FE3 plus in these patients. So remember, treatment is methylene blue. Look for a PO2 that's like 40 or 50 or so. Usually that should be around 100 and an oxygen saturation around 80%. If you know these things, this will get you so many questions for met hemoglobinemia. Number 16. If you see a patient with viral and fungal infections, plus a craniofacial defect, plus hypocalcemia, I want you thinking to George syndrome. And so generally they'll also have cardiac defects as well, but that's a little bit too easy. So they might just say that the patient has some sort of a murmur on their exam. It might not even give you a specific cardiac defect. And so the diagnosis is going to be with FISH, which is fluorescence in situ hybridization. So a really high yield note is that Williams syndrome is going to have hypercalcemia plus a very friendly child. And so buzzword for that is supravalvular aortic stenosis. And I just included this because the patient has hypercalcemia, whereas the George has hypocalcemia. So I want you to tie that together in your head. Another high yield note is phalocardiofacial syndrome. I've seen this tested as well, rarely. And so this is basically a patient with very similar like symptoms to George syndrome, but they also have a retroanathia nasal speech. So that's phalocardiofacial syndrome. Number 17, here's some of the bonus content. So if you see a patient with single umbilical artery, your next step is going to be a renal ultrasound. It's so about one in 10 to one in 20 of these patients are going to have renal anomalies. So you want to make sure that you rule that out in these patients with a single umbilical artery. Number 18, a soft occipital bone, also known as craniotabes, puts you at high suspicion for rickets. So your treatment, of course, is vitamin D, but if they have hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets, also have to supplement with phosphate. And so, of course, that's in the name, so it makes sense. Here's a test-taking tip for you. A first trimester abortion, the most common cause is going to be from a chromosome defect. So if you don't know the answer choice, then just look for one that's a chromosomal disorder, and that's going to be your safest bet for a first trimester abortion. Number 20, a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, my mnemonic is SEGA, or a cardiac rhabdomyoma, you want to be thinking of tuberous sclerosis. And so I'm about to show you a ton of pictures and a ton of words that are all basically buzzwords that you should immediately associate with tuberous sclerosis. And so tuberous sclerosis has hamartomas essentially everywhere. And so these pictures are to give you some examples. So facial angiofibromas looks like these little dots around the, the nasolabial fold as well as on the cheeks. That is high yield for tuberous sclerosis. This ash leaf spot, which is essentially a hypopigmented macule, is high yield. Ungual fibromas. I remember always seeing that word and had no idea what it was. It's basically a tumor that grows underneath of your nail bed. Chagrin patches. You see is kind of a this little connective tissue looking patch on a patient, usually on their back. A renal angiomyolipoma. 
I kind of separated this word down because I want you guys to take note of it. Angio meaning blood, myo meaning muscle, lipo meaning fat. So it's a renal mass that has tons of different types of tissue in it upon biopsy. So that's how I remember it. And then also keep in mind, tuberous sclerosis can also have infantile spasms with hypsarrhythmias on the EEG, also known as West syndrome. This is incredibly high yield, but it's not taught very often. So I want to make sure that you know it because I've seen this show up on practice questions. And so a buzz phrase with hips arrhythmias is high voltage delta waves. You don't have to diagnose this on your actual MVME in terms of looking at an EEG, but you need to know the buzz phrase itself. And so the treatment for West syndrome with these infantile spasms is ACTH. Also could have your answer choice say corticotropin. And then the second line, if that fails, is vigapatrin. Make sure you know this. So one more time for all the stuff for tuberous sclerosis. So you got SEGA, which is subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Cardiac rhabdomyoma, those two are pretty much pathognomonic with tuberous sclerosis on your exam. Facial angiofibromas is a type of hamartoma. This ash leaf spot, you should be able to identify on the exam. Ungual fibromas, here's your tumor with the nail. And shagreen patches, those are all extremely high yield buzz phrases that you need to know. And then remember the treatment is ACTH, aka corticotropin, and then second line is bigapatrin. All right, let's do some bonus TQs now. So these are things that I've seen rarely, rarely, rarely show up. But this is for if you're trying to take it to the next level, you're at 260 range, you want to take it to the 270 level knowledge. These are some of the things that you need to know. So first thing is FAPA syndrome. So P-F-A-P-A. -A. And so this is in a two to five year old patient. And the PF stands for periodic fever. They basically have a fever for four days, one time per month, every month. The A is for aptus ulcer. So they get like a sore spot in their mouth. P for pharyngitis, and then A for adenitis. So to me, the pharyngitis and adenitis are kind of generic. And so I go by the periodic fever with the aptus ulcers that immediately clues me into FAPA syndrome. So the treatment is going to be steroids and then possibly a tonsillectomy. Bonus question number two. If you see an abdominal tumor plus hematuria, if you're thinking Wilms tumor, remember that's going to be unilateral. And then an abdominal tumor without hematuria, if you're playing odds, the most common cause is going to be a neuroblastoma, which can cross midline. And of course, neuroblastoma is in your adrenals and then Wilms tumor is in your kidney. All right, last bonus TQ. This is one that trips up a lot of students. So diamond black fan anemia versus Fanconi anemia. So diamond black fan anemia and Fanconi both will have thumb abnormalities. So don't let that be the only thing you know about them. So diamond black fan is going to be a macrocytic anemia with thumb abnormalities with cardiac or craniofacial abnormalities as well. And so the key here is on the bone marrow biopsy. You're going to only have red blood cells decreased on the bone marrow biopsy with diamond black fan anemia. Everything else appears normal. And so the treatment is going to be steroids as well as blood transfusions. Fanconi anemia, on the other hand, I remember Fanconi sounds like panconi, so pancytopenia. And so everything is decreased, not just the red blood cells. And so these patients will have the thumb abnormality. Usually it's kind of like a radial defect of the thumb. They'll have elevated AFP. Keep that in mind. That's also high yield. Cafe au lait spots, and then that pancytopenia. So you do a bone marrow biopsy to work it up. They'll have hypocellular bone marrow biopsy. Everything is basically decreased. And then the treatment is going to be a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So diamond black fan anemia, you give them steroids and a blood transfusion. Fanconi, you give them a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. All right, guys, that is the high yield pediatric crash course review. Hopefully you learned some things with this. Hopefully stuff that you have heard before that you need to brush up on, as well as some things that you've never heard before to get you those extra points. I'm Dr. Price. If you need any personalized help, Follow us at actionpotentialmentoring.com and hope to see you guys soon.